New satellite images show 40 mile long convoy of Russian tanks and artillery. Satellite images, some satellite images. Today, we are able to image the Earth like never before. Show the devastating flooding caused by IRA. There's so much we can see and a lot we still can't. Wow, look at the difference. I'd like to take you on a journey of what satellites can show us, what we're missing for now, and where we might be heading. But first, we need to understand how we got here. And lift off of the Delta II rocket carrying World U-2, the most agile commercial imaging satellite. The first experimental Earth satellite to observe and report First World War when balloons became a familiar sight. Not so long ago, everything mapped we ever created was done by walking around to know where things were. There are many reasons we'd want to know what things look like. Navigation, for example, is one of them. Knowing how to go from one place to the other. But the biggest reason has probably always been figuring out what other humans are up to. From strapping cameras to kites, balloons, and even pigeons at first, World War I was about to dramatically speed up our ability to map things from the sky. We go higher and higher. We need to. It's not a matter of optics or cameras. It's just the physical limitations of the Earth, forever curving away from our sight. The rudimentary balloons slowly are replaced with nimble, moving airplanes, allowing us to see further than ever before. As one world war ends and another starts, airplanes get better, keep on going higher, faster, always trying to avoid the enemy while seeing ever more. World War II eventually comes to an end, but our ambitions to see more don't. The faster and higher flying planes etch so far up in the sky that there's barely any air to provide lift for their wings. But of the many technological innovations from World War II, one was about to dramatically change our ability to map everything. German science threw everything it had into the perfection of V2. If we can't fly our cameras high enough, we'll throw them in the sky. Enter orbits. We can't just throw things yeah. up. A thinning atmosphere doesn't mean lack of gravity. Objects still fall, though our desire to see doesn't fall with it just yet. We soon realize that if we launch a satellite not just high but fast enough parallel to the Earth, you might just miss the Earth over and over again, forever falling. You're in orbit. What was first developed as a way to send bombs, and let's be real, still continues to be, becomes a vessel for cameras and sensors, higher up in the sky than we might have ever thought possible just a few short decades ago. Once around the Earth, not even the sky is the limit. The further away we go, the more of the Earth we can see. We launch weather satellites far enough that they can see entire continents through a single lens. However, we aren't satisfied just yet. Sending satellites further away means seeing them more at once. But the closer we can get those satellites to the ground, the more details we can see. Where only continents are visible, coming closer means we can see individual cities, even buildings. This is where a tricky balance arises. The closer one gets to the ground, the more can be seen. But come too close and the air friction will slow you down in gravity. Forever present will pull you down and it's a bumpy road down there. This is where we also need to separate military from commercial satellites. It's very hard to know exactly what the militaries of different countries can and cannot see. So from here on, we're mostly going to focus on commercial stuff. Actually, real quick, I wanna talk about something. In 2019, President Trump tweeted this picture, which he probably shouldn't have but it's from a spy satellite and it shows really high resolution area over Iran. And it's only through things like this that we can kind of piece together what military satellites can show us. I thought it was a cool story. You might've heard about it. Back to the video. Specifically when looking at civilian applications, things were about to change on July 3rd, 1972. 
Perhaps no new development in space is more significant than this. The Landsat program launches and becomes the first to start monitoring huge areas at once. Instead of taking very narrow but high resolution of one area, the satellite starts taking vast ranging areas. Think of it as using a wide lens where before we were just using zoom lenses. The sensor on these satellites started getting better and better. We don't just capture red, green and blue, but also infrared and some thermal bands. See, the atmosphere absorbs some wavelengths. That's actually what prevents us from, you know, getting skin cancer. Plants absorb light to grow. Nothing new here, that's photosynthesis. So by adding a sensor that can see these bands, we can see which plants are absorbing the light and thus probably healthy, and which ones aren't. That's exactly what happens with Landsat. By taking pictures only every few weeks, we can now all of a sudden track crop health over time at the scale of entire cities, regions, and soon countries and continents. Today, the Landsat program is two satellites, continuing to image the Earth, updating a catalog of nearly 50 years of images at the scale of nearly the entire world. This is an unprecedented data set, allowing us to compare trends going back half a century. Since then, the European Union also started its own program, the Copernicus program, with the Sentinel satellites that image nearly every place on Earth about once a week. But you couldn't see a column of Russian tanks in those images. Sure, you can see crop health, but anything more detailed than that, this is not the right tool anymore. Earth observation satellites are just these huge cameras in the sky, you know, apart from the fact that they're flying at 8 kilometers a second at 400 kilometers over our heads and are solar powered and launched by what is basically strapping them on top of a huge, mostly controlled explosion. They're in fact quite similar to your average mirrorless or smartphone camera, except when you look at camera reviews, people don't really talk about image resolution. You now have a 48 megapixel sensor. 48 megapixel sensor. Satellite sensors also have a megapixel definition. Actually, I realized that's not quite true, but first let me show you something. That is the longest Landsat scene that's ever been taken, and it's 9,000 kilometers long. I just saw this halfway through and I wanted to point it out because Satellites and our smartphones and DSLRs like this camera don't actually work exactly the same. Some satellites are like telescopes and this one like a Landsat. What it does is it takes strips and so it can continue imaging pretty much forever and end up with an image that's 9,000 kilometers long. So what I'm saying isn't quite true. It doesn't really change the point that I'm making. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, back to the video. What people, mostly scientists, want to know is what can I see in the image? When you buy a mirrorless camera, it's not really a question you can answer. It depends on what you take the picture of. But conveniently, satellites are, for the most part, at a stable height above the Earth. They also only have one lens. So now it's just a case of symbol trigonometry to figure out, you know, at this megapixels, at this height, what can you see? That's where ground sample distance comes in. For a given satellite at a given orbit, What's the smallest distance you can tell apart? If you project the pixels of the cameras on the ground, how big would those pixels be? So we mentioned Landsat, for that it's about 30 centimeters. For Sentinel-2, that's 10 meters. That means the individual pixel, if you were to zoom in, would represent a 10 by 10 meter square. That's about 30 feet in freedom units. The highest resolution commercial satellites can do up to around 30 centimeters. That means that you can see individual cars, trees, houses, pools, and a lot more uniquely identifiable stuff, basically like, you know, at random Russian jet fighters or tanks. Though, so far we've overlooked one tiny little piece that makes all of this a lot more complicated. What was probably barely just an afterthought to the ballooners of World War I becomes the world's most annoying photobomber. A lot of the pictures we end up seeing aren't just because we had a satellite at just the right time at the right place. We also can only get one that's really useful if clouds aren't obscuring the way. Though, if thermal cameras and x-ray scanners allow us to see things that our eyes can't here on Earth, surely we just send one up there, right? Well, sort of. 
enter synthetic aperture radar. Every once in a while, humanity invents some weird, delightfully clever piece of engineering magic, and then gives it a convoluted name. This is one of those. Rather than taking pictures of the light reflected by the sun, the way our eyes work, these satellites send out their own signal and listen for a response. Think of it a little bit like a sonar on a submarine, except in space, and this creates an image. These images look deceptively like noisy black and white variants of optical images, though the reality is a little bit more complicated. A while back, I got to sit down with one of the leading experts in synthetic aperture radar, Professor Ian Woodhouse, who put it like this. Do you have a way of, of kind of walking people through it? Uh, yeah, so first of all, you have to abandon all your intuition when it comes to synthetic <laughs> aperture radar, right? Technicalities aside, these images allow us to see at night, but also through clouds, piercing through the eye of storms to give us views of hurricanes in times where no plane could ever fly through. One of the benefits of these radar images is also their ability to compare change. Hang on with me there just for a minute. Regular optical images enable us to compare change by having a before and after image. That's how we can see the change. While radar allows us to compare not just the two images directly, but what's called their polarization. It's like basically summing the two images together and looking at what comes out on the other side. It's a bit beyond the scope of what I want to talk here, but in practice, that means that we can see millimeter level change. From 500 kilometers up in the sky, these radar satellites can see a few millimeters from one day to the other. Now, I want to pause here because this stuff is absolutely wild. This example here is the image of a field and then the same one, but just a few days later, showing places where the grass has moved by just a few centimeters, most probably because a truck drove through the field. Now, we're not seeing the truck. We're seeing the track marks it left on the ground from 500 kilometers away in space. This doesn't mean we can see every single change. We can see millimeters, but not meters. It's depending on the wavelength of the radar, basically. If the grass was about two meters and a truck drove through it, we probably wouldn't be able to see anything. It's probably a story for another time. If we take a step back, all of this might seem like the fantasy straight out of one of the most Orwellians of nightmares. Being able to see such small changes in anything about 30 centimeters, surely this is a horrible spying thing, right? Well, there are major limitations to what we can see, or rather I should say to when we can see. The one really important thing to keep in mind here all of these are just snapshots in time, at a specific moment in time. What we have are bits of a story, not everything. So imagine watching a movie, but you're only able to see one frame every 10 minutes. You could get a sense of relatively what's happening, but you also be guessing a lot. Doesn't even matter if the movie's in 4K. Yeah, sure, maybe you see a little bit more details, but it's still limited by the number of frames you could see. Oh, and don't forget the clouds. It's basically like rolling a dice. Maybe the image you get is gonna be useful or not. We also can't take satellite images whenever we want. As mentioned, these satellites are on orbit around the Earth. They're spinning around above our heads. So if we want to image something specific, say the border of Ukraine and Russia, we have to wait for a satellite to pass over. Most of these satellites are on what's called a polar orbit, meaning they pass over the poles on what's quite, but not just yet perpendicular to the equator. The Earth spins around on its own axis, so a given satellite doesn't pass over a specific point only every couple of weeks. It depends on the satellite and the orbit. The very expensive solution is to just build more satellites. This is where you get into the economics of satellite constellation. So what's important to remember is that we still have to wait for a satellite to pass over a specific area before we can take an image. This is the path, the orbit of the satellite. It's pretty predictable. Satellite images also don't exist in a vacuum. I mean, actually, 
they do. Space is vacuum, but you know what I mean. When you're trying to piece a story of what's happening on the ground or want to map a specific location at a given time, images are only one piece of information, one source of what's going on. One of my favorite examples of that comes from an interview I did with Jeffrey Lewis, who's an open source intelligence researcher, who basically tries to piece together all the information that he can get his hands on that's available publicly to try to piece stories. Specifically, he does that for nuclear prevention, but also recently for Ukraine. His team first saw radar images of Russian tanks looking like they were on the move near the border. But again, it was just one image at one location. Then they saw a TikTok video of what looked like the same convoy heading towards the border. And then? One of my colleagues has the great idea to check Google Maps. It's like five o'clock in Monterey, which is about 3 a.m. local time in Russia slash Ukraine, because this is on the Russian side of the border. And suddenly my colleague John Ford is like, oh my God, there is a traffic jam right next to where that unit is stationed. And we're like, wait a second, it's three in the morning. There should not be a traffic jam. And it was clear to us that what was happening was the vehicles were probably getting up on the highway and they were probably preventing people with their phones from getting on the highway. So, right, that unreasonable assumption that we all have that you're going to get a minute by minute traffic update is true. I'm like, holy crap, the invasion is starting. I've mentioned the invasion of Ukraine a few times in this video now, and it's because it's one of the first conflicts where the public can have access to eyes looking down on what's going on nearly in real time. And these are not military satellites. These are private companies selling images that anybody with just a little bit of know-how can use. And these include the press. But these images are still sparse and far between in time. They're an unprecedented tool allowing us to take snapshots in time, but still have a lot of empty spaces. Satellite images can tell us in great detail how the same place may have changed from one day to the other, but nothing in between, at least not yet. What used to require pilots to jump into wooden airplanes to manually draw on a map the front line is now accessible to everyone nearly in real time. Today, we know so much about the effects of climate change because we have satellites constantly monitoring changes going back decades at this point. We can see the ice meltings, forests being cut down, and even refugee camps. But we can also see how incredibly beautiful our planet is. See it like never before, and appreciate it from a completely new vantage point. When astronauts go to space, they often experience what's known as the overview effect. They get to see the Earth from above, an overview of the planet, and usually feel a sense of awe. While the satellites we sent up in space are for research, commercial or military use, they also have given us the ability to witness what our planet looks like in a way we could have never thought so possible not that far ago. Not only that, but knowing more about our impact on the world is the first step towards being able to make a change. It's definitely not enough, and oftentimes seeing change doesn't mean understanding what's causing it or how change any of it. But at least it helps us move in the right direction. During this whole video, I've talked about what satellite imagery can show us, but nothing on where to actually get these images. That's why I'm excited to say that this video is sponsored by SkyFi. One of the elements I didn't touch on is just how complicated it's been to actually buy imagery. A lot of the satellite data providers don't necessarily show their pricing upfront or make it easy to simply buy an image without having to fill out a form or get on a call with a salesperson. SkyFi is becoming the go-to platform to just draw your area of interest and either task a new satellite or buy existing archival imagery all in a clear price upfront matter. I can't really understate how big of a change this is for what we can do with satellite images. In this video, I wanted to show that these images can be used for all sorts of applications, but bringing access to these images to anybody who could just be curious to try something rather than needing technical know-how or going through sales calls opens up even more use cases. I've been in this industry for a few years now and seeing SkyFi come in and take the user experience of actually buying images seriously has been great to see. In fact, some of the high resolution 30 centimeter images 
in this video were ordered directly on SkyFi's platform. So if you want to also play around with some of these images, head over to skyfi.com. They also recently announced they would support free open data like some of the ones we've discussed in this video, specifically they're starting with Sentinel-2. So if you want to get some free images or pay for some higher resolution ones, SkyFi is the place to go.